Hello, dear brothers and sisters and friends. Welcome you all to Cardiff Chinese Christian Church English Service. And this morning, I would like to extend our warm welcome to any one of you who are new to us, and in particular to our ESF Fellowship members. We are so happy to have you back with us. And this morning, I would like to start our Sunday service with a prayer. In fact, it's an invitation、uh, to join me in prayer, praying for the COVID-19 situation. Of course, as you know,、uh, Wales now is one more time back into a national lockdown, and this is because of the COVID-19 situation. But we also know this is not just in Cardiff or in Wales, but it's just across UK, across the world. So therefore, let us really one more time pray to God, asking for God's grace and mercy, also asking for strength from God. For us in particular as Christians, may God teach us what is the right thing to do, setting up the, a good example for others. But also at the same time as Christians, may God teach us also what is the Christian thing to do, so that we may set up a good Christian testimony for others. Guiding them, leading them back to God in moments like this. So let's have a word of prayer together. Let's all bow down our heads. Dear God, dear Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you, Lord. We really humble ourselves and surrender ourselves to you, God. In particular, to this COVID nineteen situation. One more time, Lord, across the world, we can see cases keep on rising up. People, more and more people,、uh, will be suffering from this、uh, pandemic. Whether it is the health, whether it is the emotionally, whether it is the family, the loved ones, God, plenty of people will be go through a dark times. So God, in you we trust. We ask and pray. May Lord Jesus Christ, you will be with us. May your grace and your mercy be with us. May you grant us wisdom and strength. May you grant us faith in you. But in particular, God, we pray for us as a Christian. May Lord Jesus, you teach us. What is the right thing? What is the Christian thing for us to do in moment like this? To be the light of the world, salt to the earth, to bring people out of darkness into your light. So, Lord Jesus, in you we trust, and in you we commit and dedicate today, and also our Sunday service into your hand. May you be our God. May you be our King to rule sovereign over us. We give thanks and pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So now we're going to proceed on to our online greetings. So please have your phone ready and go to our church WhatsApp group. And whenever you're ready, let's send our greetings to each other. Okay, so let's put down our phone and let us prepare our heart and mind to praise and worship our God. And this morning we're going to read the passage. It is from Psalm, Psalm thirty-six, Psalm thirty-six, verses five to nine. Psalm thirty-six, verse five. It says, "Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens; your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains; your justice like the great deep. You, Lord." Preserve both people and animals. Your price, how priceless is your unfailing love, O God! People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delight. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. May this Psalm thirty-six verses five to nine be our words of encouragement. So now we are going to、uh, read the Apostles' Creed together, and then we shall start praising and worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us read the Apostles' Creed together. Ready? One, two, three. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us prepare our heart and mind to praise and worship our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, for He is most worthy of all our praises and worship. Let us all stand up to sing our first song for this morning, God of Ages. This song reminds us of God's love, promises, and faithfulness, and therefore it is in God we trust. Let us sing, God of Ages. together. Dear God, dear Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you and we thank you. You are the same yesterday, today and forever. Your mercy and your compassion, they are renewed every morning. And God, you promise us that those who trust in you, those who hope in you, will renew our strength and we will soar on wings like eagles. Therefore, God, in you we trust and in you we submit ourselves. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks and praise. Amen.
my strength when that I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all and all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame Rising again, bless your name You are my all in all When I fall down, you pick me up When I am dry, you fill my cup You are my all in all Jesus Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to 8, Apostle Paul said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us encourage one another to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow our Lord Jesus daily for his glory on holy ground we stand before the king of kings and lord of all where saints have walked this road before carry their cross through heaven's door to the king of heaven all the angels sing and i will join the song and ancient melody a song that i will sing for all eternity it's all around the world hearts in harmony worship to the king who reigns eternally It's all around the world, hearts in harmony. Whoa. 
worship to the King who reigns eternally. And I will join the song and ancient melody, a song that I will sing for all eternity. It's all around the world, hearts in harmony. Worship to the King who reigns eternally. And I will join the song, a song that I will sing for all eternity. It's all around the world, hearts in harmony. Worship to the King who reigns eternally. I will join the song and sing. Let us pray. Dear God, dear Lord Jesus Christ, once again we praise you and we worship you. But God, we also surrender ourselves to you. Help us, Lord. May we trust in you at all times. May you be our God and our Savior, especially during these times of difficulties. Thank you, God. Thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for your faithfulness. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now is the time for offering. Offering is the privilege and duty for each and every single Christian. It is one of the ways for us to uh, give back to God and as a response for the blessings and the provision of God uh, into our life. So if we have Christians among us who do not understand the meaning of offering or for our non-Christian friends, you do not need to take part in the offering. And during these uh, online services, we will encourage brothers and sisters for you to uh, do your offering via bank transfer. So if you need the details of our bank uh, account, please approach our English church treasurer, uh, Brother Kobe. So now let's have a word of prayer for the offering. Let's pray. Dear God, dear Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you, Lord, for your protection, for your guidance, and for your provision, even during these times of uh, COVID-19 situation. God, we know the uh, situation can be tough, the economy can be tough, but yet, nonetheless, God, your love is still with us at all times. So therefore, Lord Jesus Christ, as your children, as your people, as your disciples, we ask and pray that you will teach us how to respond back to you. And God, this amount of offering we have uh, given to you, God, we pray, may you bless this money, may it be used wisely to expand your kingdom so that more people may come to know you and be saved, Lord. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So now we're going to proceed on to our uh, scripture reading for today's uh, sermon's passage, and then I will uh, pass the time to our guest speaker, Pastor Jonathan Harris, for today's sermon. Today's Bible reading is taken from the book of Psalms, Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to be with you. Although I'm not with you, obviously, in person, and that's a bit of a shame. But still, it's great to once again be able to uh, bring God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that, although it was written so long ago, still speaks to us in our situation today. And we ask that by your Holy Spirit that you would bring your word alive to our hearts and in our hearts your spirit would move us to respond 
to what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you're going through a series of messages at the moment on trusting God. And I don't know how many of those messages are based on the Psalms, but all I can say is that in challenging times, the book of Psalms is always a good place to go for Christians. And I know personally over the years when I faced uh, challenges, difficult times, I nearly always come back to the Psalms. And I remember that happened again back in March when the pandemic hit. I thought, where should I go to in the word of God? I'll go back to uh, the Psalms. And here in Psalm 13, we find David in a difficult time, a time of uh, struggle. And we'll look at the details in just a minute. But simply to say how in that time of struggle, David's default is to turn to God. And that's what we see throughout the Psalms, as the Psalms deal with a whole range of emotions, a whole range of situations. The default of the psalmist, the immediate reaction of the psalmist is to turn to God. And that should be always, if we know the Lord, always be our first course of action. Whatever our circumstances, whether good or bad, whatever our emotional state right now, whether up or down, we are to look to the Lord. As it says in the book of James, if anyone, is anyone among you suffering, then let him pray and pray to God. Is anyone cheerful? Let him, let him sing praise, sing praise to God. So the Psalms from beginning to end point us, however else we're dealing with the situation, however else we're finding help and support, and there may be many avenues for that, but they point us to turn to God. Now in this particular Psalm, Psalm 13, this short Psalm, we're going to see David move from a lament of complaint to God to a song of confident trust. He starts down in the valley, but he manages to end up on the hilltop. And that's good news. It means that as this psalm has a happy ending for us. But we're going to have to start down in the valley. And for David, it was a deep one. It was one where God's presence somehow seemed blocked out completely. The particular challenge is in this psalm, David's trouble seems to be dragging on and on and on. Can you relate? I think all of us can relate when it comes to the pandemic. How many of us hoped, perhaps a little bit too optimistically, that by this time in 2020, we would be over the worst uh, of it? But uh, now we're back in lockdown. We're back to restrictions. We don't really know what's going to happen uh, next. And the coronavirus cloud is still overshadowing our lives and the lives of people all over the world. So like David, we might be thinking, we might even be praying, how long, O oh Lord? The phrase war of attrition uh, comes to mind. That phrase, war of attrition, means a prolonged period in which one side seeks to gradually wear down the other. And in this prolonged trial, it seems that we can easily get worn down, 
Sometimes we might feel a bit more up, a bit more positive, but as it goes on and on, it's easy to get worn down. And there's David. He's so worn down by this ongoing trial, it's like he's on the verge of despair. How many of us, I think all of us, would like our troubles, we realize troubles will come, but we'd like our troubles to be very short and quickly uh, resolved. But that's not the experience of God's people all the time. I can think of at least one Christian I know who suffered long-term, often painful illness. I can think of others who are facing ongoing struggles with their children. I can think of those Christians who are suffering mental health issues over a prolonged period. And I can think of Christian workers who've labored hard for many years and are battling discouragement because they're seeing, it seems, little fruit from their labors. And if we should think that this phenomena of facing a struggle week after week, month after month, maybe year after year, is the result of some spiritual deficiency, then we need our thinking corrected by God's word. You see, that phrase, how long, O Lord, appears many times on the lips of the writers of Scripture. In fact, it appears 22 times in the book of Psalms, four times in the beginning of this Psalm of David, Psalm 13. But the phrase also appears famously on the lips of the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk witnessed the wrongs that were going on in his nation. He was longing for God to do something and intervene. And he cries out, how long, O Lord, shall I cry for help and you will not hear? So the cry, how long, is one that is certainly not wrong to bring to God. And God, as we see in the Psalms, as we see in the prophets, is not phased, he's not upset when we come to him honestly, sharing our emotions of struggle, perhaps frustration, and uh, sometimes discouragement. But as I was preparing this message, I made an interesting discovery. I want to ask you a question in terms of your Bible knowledge. Do you know who the first person in the Bible that is recorded to say how long? Do you know who it was? It wasn't Habakkuk. It wasn't Isaiah. It wasn't David. Who was the first person in the Bible that said how long? I'll tell you it was. It was God. God himself. Let me read God's words from Exodus chapter 10, verse 3. It's when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Pharaoh refused and God began to send the plagues. And God had sent seven plagues on the Egyptians. And then this is what it says. And Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, thus says the Lord, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself? Let my people go. God says, how long, Pharaoh, before you refuse to humble yourself and listen to my discipline? Take note of what I am doing. And then later, God says, the same thing, but this time, not about Pharaoh and the Egyptians, but about the Israelites. After the Israelites were rescued from slavery in Egypt and were led through the desert by Moses, it says they grumbled constantly against God. 
And it says, and the Lord said to Moses, this is in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? And it made me wonder something. I wondered we are saying, looking at this pandemic, how long is it going on? But perhaps God is saying, how long? How long will these people, the people in the world, continue to go their own way instead of turning to me? I think particularly in the nations like this nation that has had so much opportunity to hear God's word, to hear the gospel, and yet so many have turned away from God. Perhaps God's saying, how long? What is it going to take before they turn to me for help? But let me make it personal. See, I'm not quite sure why you're, you're watching this morning. I'm sure some of you are hungry to hear the word of God, to be encouraged in your walk with God. But maybe there's someone and you're listening, but you know you're actually not walking with God. Maybe you've never turned to Jesus and committed your life to him. And maybe God's saying to you, how long? How long are you going to wait? How long are you going to keep going your own way? So perhaps the challenge for you this morning is not to be asking how long is this situation going to be carrying on? But to ask yourself, how long will I keep going my own way instead of God's way? How long before I turn back to God or before I commit my life to Jesus Christ? And maybe you need to be saying it's been long enough, long enough. And maybe this morning you would say, Lord, I'm coming back to you. I'm turning back to you. I'm not going to live any longer away from you. And let me take you now to the final time the phrase how long appears in the Bible. It's actually in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation chapter 6. And it comes from the lips of saints in heaven. Those that have given their lives because of their witness to Jesus Christ and to the word of God. And it says in Revelation chapter 6, they cried out, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And that final how long reminds us of the big picture and one very important truth that the cries of how long for God from God's people and indeed the how long from God himself concerning our rebellious world will ultimately come to a conclusion. That conclusion will be when Jesus returns and God will judge the world with righteousness that, in the end, is the great hope of those that have put their lives in God's hands. Brothers and sisters, as believers in Jesus Christ, our ultimate hope is not in the end of the pandemic. Our ultimate hope is in Jesus and the promise of heaven. But in the meantime, we live in this broken world, a world where all of creation is groaning until one day the big picture of this fallen world will reach its conclusion. But that big picture affects us all individually. And that brings us back to David's how long in Psalm 13. Now David's struggle, as we look at the psalm, really is somewhat undefined. It doesn't have a lot of specifics about it, but that, I think, is helpful because it allows us, in some ways, to put our own situation 
into uh, the psalm. And in regards to his struggle and his four questions how long, he looks at it from three vantage points. He looks, first of all, to God, then he looks in himself, and then he looks out at others, particularly his enemies. In regards to God, he says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? In other words, he feels forgotten and rejected. Now, I'm sure David knew he was not actually forgotten. If he did think that, the Bible assures us that God will never forget his own. But in Scripture, God remembering is always linked to God doing something. We see that in the case of Noah. We see that in the case of the Israelites in Egypt. When God remembered them, he set about to do something. And what David is seeing is from his perspective, God isn't doing anything. So he's saying, God, have you forgotten me? And I'm sure there's many times that all of us have prayed and we prayed a long time for something and it doesn't seem like anything's happening. And so we can perhaps think, well, God, how long have you forgotten me? We know that he hasn't, but he doesn't seem to be doing anything. Perhaps he's on a long-term furlough, you know, if we can say that without being uh, irreverent. But still we feel forgotten, or we feel uh, rejected in the sense that God seems distant. And that's how David is feeling. God seems a, a long way away. And then in regard to himself, he, he considers how he, he talks to himself. And he says, how long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? I can imagine David, you know, lying awake at night, going over the problem, trying to think about the, the solution. I know someone right now who is, is waking up uh, at night thinking, well, ha what's going to happen in my business? Because things have changed dramatically over the last few months and, and it's troubling them. And they're waking up and it's playing over and over in their mind. I'm sure David was like that. And David talks about the sorrow in his heart all the day long. It's like a burden that he's, he's carrying. Uh, maybe not always in the forefront, but it's always there some way. And perhaps for this year, uh, as you look at the year, you know, there's a degree of sadness, you know, particularly lockdown coming, you think, oh, my goodness, you know, I should be out uh, enjoying time with my friends, doing stuff with others. And we can feel a sense of loss, uh, a sense of sadness. We can just feel stuck in this situation and 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 david is just grappling it with it in his in his heart and his mind and then in regard to others david is thinking about his enemy he says how long shall my enemy be exalted over me now we don't know exactly who that particular enemy was we know that for many years saul made himself david's enemy king saul who pursued uh, David and tried to uh, destroy him and then as a soldier and as a king as David's calling was he would have faced many enemies and in this situation David's uh, enemy whoever he, he was thinking of seems to be on the ascendancy now for us as Christians the Bible says as we saw in in first Peter not too long ago our enemy it's not a physical enemy, but it's the great spiritual enemy, Satan. And if we love God, it's easy to look around the world and think that Satan is the one that's winning. And even in our own lives, we can feel pretty powerless against him. So wherever David turns, and perhaps wherever we turn, whether it's to God or on ourselves or to his enemy, this conflict is there and David is saying, how long? And he's down in the dumps. He doesn't see an immediate answer. 
But yet, he finds a pathway that brings him out of that valley. Because he doesn't stop at complaint. He knows the way out. And the way out is the pathway of prayer. That's where he goes in verse 3. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. It's clear that, that David knows in his heart of hearts that God is a God who hears and answers the prayer of his people. And though his request is, is not spelt out, it's implied that he's, he's presented a specific request to God. Because he, he says, consider, consider my prayer and answer me. It's probably deliverance from his, his enemies and rescue, uh, obviously, from the situation that he is, is in. And he's expecting a definite answer. So the pathway out of despair for the Christian is to turn our concerns, our burdens, our worries about whatever it is into prayer. And that's the invitation God gives us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15. It says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we might receive mercy and found grace to help us in our time of need. Or as a children's chorus I used to sing when I was young says, when you're down in the dumps and feeling blue and you're fighting the devil and you don't know what to do, just call on the Lord and he'll rescue you anytime, any place, anywhere. Prayer is the pathway out of despair. David calls on the Lord. He's feeling blue, but he prays. But he doesn't just pray. You see, like so many prayers in the Bible, we see prayer here in Psalm 13 is argued prayer. In other words, David prays and then gives good reasons to God why he should answer his prayer. Now, that's bold, but we see it repeated time and time again in Scripture. He spells out in Psalm 13 three arguments in verses 3 and 4 why God should answer his prayer. The first is, basically, if you don't help me, God, I'm going to die. This is what he said. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Now, some commentators think this indicates that part of David's problem is that he's suffering a serious illness and that is certainly a possibility but we can't say for sure. Now I don't think David was actually afraid of dying but actually David knew that if he died he would not fulfill God's purpose for his life and that was to become the king and shepherd over Israel to unite God's people under God. David knew God had a plan for his life. And should he die, that plan would not be fulfilled. And certainly as Christians, I don't think we should fear death if we are in Christ. We have the sure promise of heaven. But it's right to pray that God would preserve us that we might fulfill whatever plans and purposes God has for us. The second reason David gives for God to answer his prayer is this, lest my enemy say I prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Now David knew as he was the one chosen to be God's king, that any enemy of his was actually an enemy of God and God's purposes. Now, as we said, our enemy is Satan. And while I'm not particularly keen to give too much mention of Satan in praying, I think the Bible gives us warrant to keep our enemy in mind as we pray. In fact, Jesus, in the prayer that he taught us, the Lord's Prayer, said, deliver us from evil. 
And nearly every commentator will say it really means deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from Satan and his attacks and his temptations on our life. And we can certainly pray with confidence against Satan's purposes to be fulfilled. We know that Satan, our enemy, delights when we're miserable, when we're complaining, when we're down. We know that he loves it when we feel weak and discouraged. And he certainly uh, delights when the church is not fulfilling its purposes. So there's a strong argument that we can pray that God will be pleased, God will be glorified, and Satan will be thwarted in what happens in our life. So David presents these reasons to answer his uh, prayer. I think I said there were three reasons. Well, actually, the, the two, second and the third uh, go together. Lest uh, my enemies say I prevailed over him. And third, lest my foes rejoice because I am uh, shaken. But there's an even more fundamental reason in David's words that indicate why he can come to God with boldness, expecting an answer from God. He says, consider me and answer me, O Lord, my God. David can say, the Lord is my God. He's my rock, my strong tower, my shepherd, my light. He's mine and I am his. And this is the assurance that we must have if we're to come with confidence to God. To say, I am God's child through faith in Jesus Christ. And through Jesus, I can say, you are my God. And again, if today you cannot say that, if you're facing the challenges and struggles of life, maybe you've got a vague belief in God that he can help you, but you cannot say with confidence, God is my God because I've committed my life to him through Jesus. I want to encourage you again to turn your life over to Jesus right now. So David prayed and he we will see that he has now found the pathway out of despair. The situation isn't necessarily changing immediately, but things are changing in his heart because he goes on in verses 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. David moves from prayer to praise and it's something that involves his will, his mind, his heart, his emotions and also his body. He starts with his mind and his will and he starts with a but. That but indicates a contrast from the previous outlook, a turning the corner, something has changed. He's basically saying, I might be downcast. I might not see the answer yet. My enemies might seem to be winning, but, and what's the but? But I have trusted in your steadfast love. David, having cast his burden on the Lord in prayer, is choosing now to plant his feet on the solid rock of God's unfailing love. And the wonderful thing is that if you are in Christ, you can do the same. Romans 8, the passage that talks about creation groaning and ourselves groaning in this falling world, goes on to tell us at the end of Romans 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, it might seem a bit perverse to some of you, but sometimes to me, it helps me to think of the worst case scenario. Do you ever think like that? What is the very worst that could happen in this situation? What's the very worst? The pandemic going on for another five years? You know, my studies being on hold for the indefinite future? You know, my, my job being lost completely? I mean, there are 
worst case scenarios to our situation, aren't they? But when you think of the worst case scenario, it's good then to remember that in Christ, nothing can separate me from God's wonderful, everlasting, unchanging love. And you can tell when you have started to climb the mountain from misery through prayer to praise, when you choose to say, I'm trusting in your love, God. I'm not focusing so much on what my eyes can see, my circumstances, what the news tells me, my feelings, but what your word reveals to me, that you're a God whose love is steadfast and unfailing. But it doesn't stop there for David. It doesn't stop with his will. It goes on to affect his heart, his emotions, because he says, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Now, I do think there's a, an overlap here between his, his will, because he's choosing to rejoice, but his emotions moving into a situation where he, he definitely begins to rejoice and find joy. And he finds joy in his salvation. He knows that God has rescued him in the past, and he's confident that God will rescue him now. And he finds joy in that. George Muller, who was a great man of faith, said this, the first and great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day is to make my soul happy in the Lord. To come to that place of remembering God and his salvation and to find happiness in the Lord. And that's where David has got to. He's dragged himself out of the depths and he's got to this happy state of rejoicing in God and his salvation. And finally, we see David employing not just his mind, his will, his emotions, but his body in praise, specifically his lungs and voice, because he says that he is ready to sing to the Lord. You know, we can't sing together even when we get together, but we can sing to the Lord. And maybe when the, the last song is sung and you're at home and you don't have to worry about social distancing, you can sing along a song of praise to God. Or if you're with others and you're feeling a bit embarrassed when you're on your own, find a song of praise to sing to the Lord and David's song is, he has dealt bountifully with me. Now that phrase is synonymous, synonymous with the famous phrase in Psalm 23, my cup runs over. God has given me more than I need. And that's a word of testimony from David, but also I think it's a statement of faith of what God was going to do. God's going to make my cup overflow. He's going to deal bountifully with me. And I think as we choose to focus on God's love after bringing our needs and our situation to God in prayer, as we remember and find joy in God's salvation, particularly our eternal salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ through his death on the cross, then we too should, I hope, be able to sing because of God's goodness and all he's done for us. So we see David now at the end of the psalm. He started off so low, but now he's up on the mountain. And that's where God wants us to come to. But let me add just a few closing comments. First of all, we don't know how long it took David to get there. We can read the psalm in just less than a couple of minutes. But actually, for David, it might have taken a few hours. It might have taken a few weeks. We don't know. It doesn't always happen straight away that in turning to God, we can go from despair to rejoicing. But he got there in the end. That's the first thing. Second thing is that we don't know if David, having got to that place of rejoicing in the Lord and being joyful and confident in God, if the next morning when he woke up, 
he was down in the dumps and feeling blue again. It's quite possible because such is human nature. And maybe he had to pick himself up, pray and focus on the goodness of God again. And so it is for us. It's not like we can just say, okay, read the psalm, sing the song, and we'll be up on the mountain forevermore. But with God's help, if we follow God's pathway of prayer and focusing on his goodness, we can come out of that pit of despair and come to that place of confident praise. And that's where the Lord wants us to be. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for David and thank you for his honesty with you about how he felt and about his frustration. But also thank you that he's an example to us. He found that pathway out of the pit of despair through coming to you in prayer and understanding your word and your purposes for his life and focusing on your goodness and all that you had done for him to come to that place of praise. And Lord, we know in reality it's not always easy for us to do that, but help us by your spirit and through the guidance of your word to seek to be in that place where we can say, my trust, my confidence is in you and I rejoice in your salvation and I give thanks and praise for all your bountiful goodness to me. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and have a good rest of your Sunday. As we come to the end of today's service, let's have a word of prayer together and also receive the benediction from above. Let's all bow down our heads. Dear God, dear Lord Jesus Christ, one more time, God, we give thanks to you, Lord, for your faithful servants of, to deliver uh, your message to us today. Through today's message, through today's Bible passage, God, one more time you remind us, Lord, you encourage us, Lord, of who you are. And also during our time of difficulty, during our time of distress, we can always call upon you, Lord. God, we give thanks to you for your faithfulness, for your love, for your mercy. But God, we also pray may you teach us to be able to rely on you at all times. If God so that is in you we trust, and you and you alone. Let's now receive the blessing from above with faith. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the eternal love and mercy of our Heavenly Father, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all from now on, to forever. Amen. This is the end of today's Sunday service. After your own personal prayer or quiet meditation, you may end here. But we also encourage you, however, to join us later on for online fellowship via Zoom. That will start in a few minutes. And also in regard to next Sunday, it will be the first week of the month. So therefore, we are going to have a Holy Communion service. And brothers and sisters in Christ who are taking part in the Holy Communion, may I uh, encourage you or invite you to prepare your uh, bread and cup beforehand so that we may partake the Holy Communion together next Sunday. So please take care of yourself and may God bless you and we shall see you again next week. Yeah.